Praise the Lord. I uh, am glad to be here amongst you this morning. Uh, the, on the Sunday that we do once a year, uh, which is focused on missions, and we call Mission Sunday. And uh, as such, I am going to uh, uh, take a pause from our study of Acts. I'm going to bring a little bit of a different message today, just to remind us for on the call of missions and our purpose uh, as a Christian uh, with regards to missions. So let us read. Uh, first, I'm going to read right at the beginning of everything, where it started. So let's go to Genesis chapter 1. I'm going to read verse 11. Genesis chapter 1, verse 11. And God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth, and it was so. And the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth, and it was so. Praise God. Amen. So we all know this is from the account of creation. And this was the third day. And as God, as Genesis, Moses, as he wrote uh, Genesis here, kind of goes through the order of creation that God, as he was uh, creating different aspects of uh, heaven and earth. And on the third day, um, he comes to a place where the earth is now created, but he didn't have any trees or fruits or anything. So he said, let the earth bring forth grass and herbs and trees, fruit trees yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself. So this uh, particular phrase is what I want to focus on today. Um, it's incredible how God, when he made life, he created in each form of life the ability, whether it's a microscopic uh, cell or a giant uh, mammal, blue whale, right? A uh, blue whale that um, uh, is bigger than anything we can imagine created in itself the ability to propagate its own species, right? To double, to multiply, to exponentially grow from itself into replicas of itself, right? So this is what is described here, a fruit tree yielding fruit after his own kind. So just like that, an oak tree, when it produces uh, the, the pine cone, right, and is scattered and, and creates, or the acorn, sorry, uh, and it creates um, more oak tree, right? An oak tree does not make a banana plant, unless somebody has come up with a clever invention to do that. No, an oak tree makes what? More oak tree, right? Uh, human beings make more human beings, right? Cheetahs make more cheetahs. You're getting the point? So God, when he created fruit trees, he said, you're going to make this fruit. Has uh, The outside of the fruit is, you know, for sustenance, right? People can eat it to get nourishment. And uh, it's packed with all kinds of nutrients, which is good for a season. But the real crux of the matter is in the middle of the fruit. And that's a seed that has the genetic code or the computer, uh, the, the information that we, uh, you know, uh, code today has the code to go replicate itself, right? So the tree, through the elements of nature, right, through the wind or storms or soil erosion, different mechanisms, people taking fruit and bringing it to different places, throwing out the seeds, Different mechanisms create a way for this fruit tree to propagate itself. You all with me? Simple stuff this morning, right? So that way, so oak trees can continue to make more oak trees. Yes? Okay, so this particular thing is the same. Oh, it went off. 
talk, guys. Uh, this particular thing, the same thing we're talking about with regards to mission. And, and the seed, it gets dispersed. It doesn't matter how the seed gets dispersed. The point is, does the tree reproduce? That's why God, when he made all forms alive, he said what? Go be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. This is the plan of God. Nobody ever does anything and say, I want to be the same as I was yesterday. Right? We all want uh, whatever we have in our life. We want more what? More salary, uh, more promotions. We want uh, more children. We want our children to grow, right, and be fruitful. So everything that we have in our own lives, in our worldly lives, we want to grow and multiply. This is the plan of God, and this is the design of God that ultimately ties to how his kingdom expands. He's just showing that through his creation, right? We can see the fingerprints of God in every aspect of creation. This is just another example. You all with me? Okay. All right. So with that, let us turn to Mark chapter 4 and 5. So Mark chapter 4 and 5. Um, I'm going to just read a couple of verses, since this is very familiar to all of you. Uh, verse 3 says, Hearken, there, behold, there went out a sower to sow. And it came to pass, as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and the fowls of the air came and devoured it up. And some fell on stony ground, where it had not much earth, and immediately it sprang up, because it had no depth of earth. And when the sun was up, it was scorched, because it had no root, it withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no fruit. And, on the, uh, and the other fell on good ground, and did yield fruit that sprang up and increased and brought forth some thirty, some sixty, and some and Hundred. Well, first of all, thank God for the good ground. If it did not bring 30, 60, or 100, how would it make up for all the seed that fell on thorny ground or wayside or a hard, uh, a hard place, right? All these unproductive seeds are falling on all this unproductive soil. All that has to be made up by the seed that fell on the fertile ground. That has to bring 30, 60, 100 fold, right? So thank God for the fertile ground. Okay, so we know this parable very well. The first thing you see is a sower went to sow. So without sowing the seed, the, the tree will not propagate itself. Without dispersing the fruit which has a seed inside of it, that tree cannot propagate. So a sower has to sow the seed. In this example, uh, tying back to the Genesis chapter, the sower, in the example in nature, the sower is a tree, right? And the, by the uh, environmental elements, it gets dispersed. So, but here, this is talking about the Word of God, right? And the seed is the Word of God, but the seed is also Christ, right? As John says what? The word is Christ. So we are, rep when we sow the seed, we are replicating the Christ that was implanted in us and if it brought forth fruit, we are replicating the Christ that was in us in others when we sow the seed. This is so important to understand. Because this, we can't, we can't sow, if you're an oak tree, we can't sow banana. If you're an oak tree, you can't sow mango, right? Or a mango can't sow uh, oak. It's the Christ that is within you is the seed that has to be replicated. Amen. You all with me? Amen. So what happens is, as the so first thing is, the sower sowed, and then... Um, you know, some of it just went by the wayside and the birds came and ate, right? So it's a, de 
you know, sometimes you sow the seed and you think like you're sharing Christ with somebody or you're working in somebody's life, nothing happens because that person, you know, is just in one year and out the other year, right? There's, that happens. And sometimes then it falls on this hard ground and no root. And so when that person might receive the word with gladness, but any time they face a difficulty or, uh, or a, a persecution or some obstruction because of the word, they kind of just, you know, it dies and it does not produce any fruit, right? And then some of the seed fell on amongst thorns. Now, this is the one I want to just focus on, these couple of things. Uh, so go with me to chapter, the same chapter, verse 19 and 20. And the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the lusts of other things entering in choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. And these are they which are sown on good ground, such as hear the word and receive it and bring forth fruit and thirtyfold, sixty and hundred. So the ones that fell among the thorn are the ones who don't bring fruit because they're so distracted and crushed of what? Because either they're deceived through their riches and comforts of this world, or they have other passions that they're so chasing after, and it chokes and crushes the word that was the Christ uh, that was in, implanted in them. It's crushed, and they can't propagate the seed of Christ in others. So in this instance, sometimes, even though we know we have to spread the word, we choose to still try to do that, but it's not the Christ that is in you working through you. What I mean by that is, so we try to make up for it by just you know, doing missions or other things that we think we're supposed to do, but it's not Christ working through you. It's not the seed of Christ. It's just that we're chasing after the things of this world, but we try to make up for the things we're lacking by just doing something else. That's like the oak trying to spread mango fruit, right? The first thing is we had to come back to the cause of the problem. What are the thorns that are crushing out the seed of Christ in our life? What thing is standing in the way from the seed flow falling on good ground? We don't have a lack of people ministering to us or sowing the seed in our lives. We don't have a lack of you know, messages or church meetings or fellowships or whatever medium, whether you come to Hebron or you go to another church, you go to, uh, you know, I don't know, if you listen to the word online, we have no lack or dearth of the word of God today. But why does the word get choked? What are these thorns in our life that choke out Christ from being propagated through us in others, right? This is what we have to ask ourselves. And every man know what it is about themselves that's preventing it, right? We don't have to think about other people. What is it? Is it the comforts of today? Is it the rich society we live in? Are we deceived by that, thinking that everything's okay? Right? Are we, uh, are we chasing after, are we overburdened or complicated our lives with so many things that just crush the word of God from growing fruitfully in our lives? Or are we fruitful and fertile so that he can, through us, produce so many fruit that is exponentially greater than what was implanted in us? This, remember, this is the law of the kingdom of God. What you received is not what you produce. You might only get a mustard seed, but you make a giant tree, Right? We don't have to worry about how much it grows, but are we allowing it to grow? Are we creating an environment for the word to thrive in? Are we, have we shut out the things that prevent it? That is the question. We need to stop doing missions or all these things because we just feel like that's another thing we've got to do. 
That's not what God is expecting from us. If it's like he told Esther, right? If not you, somebody else he'll bring up, right? The point is not to do another work, to do things, missions for the sake of doing missions. The point is, is Christ growing in you so that you can spread his seed to others, right? This is what we have to examine ourselves constantly. So I'm going to uh, just share this um, uh, example from uh, chapter 5. There's no time, so I want to just quickly ex explain it. Um, so chapter 5, you know, so Jesus is on this one side of, uh, uh, he's on the west side of the Sea of Galilee. He's going around town to town, and people are coming to him with all kinds of sicknesses, and everybody he, that came to him, he healed every single one, right? And the power of God is just being manifested. People are just amazed. This has never happened before. And the word of God was being propagated. And through miracles and signs and wonders, his word was being confirmed. And people were seeing an overflowing of the working of the power of God. At this moment, just like Pastor spoke recently about how Philip, when he was in the middle of a revival in Samaria, immediately he, God told him to go to the middle of the desert to preach to a eunuch. Somebody that nobody ever might want to interact with. Right? So at this moment, when Christ was in on the west side of Galilee, right? West side, best side, right? Where he, every, the action was, he told his disciples, let's get in the ship and go to the other side. Was there this huge sea of people waiting for him? No. He went to the other side into the land of the Gadarenes. And did he go to the town? No. He went to a cemetery. Okay, first of all, that's not on TripAdvisor. Okay, if you go to gatherings, the top attraction is not, well, you better go visit that cemetery in the gatherings, right? That is not the attraction. This is so where somebody was there that Christ saw. And he wanted to go minister to him. He was somebody that was rejected by society. That nobody had, everybody had given up. And they had the right reason to do that. They had the reason to reject him because what? He was harming other people and he was harming himself. This was a man that was possessed by thousands of devils, right? It says legion when Jesus came and... Uh, and the devil, the man, immediately the, the spirits that were in him recognized the king of kings and lord of lords. And they came and ran before Jesus and bowed down at his feet and said, Are you come to torment us before the time? Right? And he said, uh, Are you came to condemn us? The spirits know the king of kings and lord of lords. Yes. Amen? You all with me? So they came and bowed down before Christ and so this man that was possessed with thousands of devils that nobody wanted, and he was so strong, he was breaking the chains, and they couldn't bind him, he was hurting himself, and he was, um, it says in verse 4 of chapter 5, uh, 3 and 4, who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no man could bind him, no, not with chains, because that he had often bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and fetters broken in pieces, Neither could any man tame him. And always night and day he was in the mountains and in the tombs crying and cutting himself with stones. It's such a, um, uh, a depressing scene that somebody was hurting and there was nobody to help him. He was hurting himself and he was so powerful. Sometimes we think, he was so strong and powerful. Sometimes we look at people in positions and we think that so, uh, somebody is doing so well, right? They're strong, they're successful, and they're mighty, and they're a pioneer in the field they're in. And yet, inside, they're cutting themselves. Inside, they're struggling with, you know, depression. Inside, they're struggling with anxiety, Whatever might be the problem that they're facing, 
And on the outside, they look strong, and they're among us. We, can we be like Jesus who go to the other shore to meet that person where they're at? Who did God place in your life that is struggling like this? Amen. So this person was hurting himself. And God went to where he was. Jesus went to minister one person. Not a sea of people. Just one person. And he immediately, and I'm going to fast forward, you know, you know what happens, right? He cast out the devils, right? And the devil said, okay, okay don't, don't condemn us. Can we go into this, uh, you know, uh, group of pigs, right? Uh, I still don't understand why fully. But anyways, the pigs um, uh, ran off the cliff and killed themselves. This is the way of the devil. It only leads to destruction, right? This is the way of unrighteousness. When we follow the path of sin, it leads to destruction and death and condemnation. But in life in Christ is a life of peace and joy and a sound mind. Amen? But we can't look at people in need and say we're going to stay on the west side where things are much better. We can't do that. We have to go to where people need us. And that's the message of missions. Not because we're obligated not because we're following uh, tradition or laws or whatever, you know. Even if we're unsuccessful, even if not a single person comes to Christ through our efforts. But as long as we're shedding the fruit, just like an oak tree. Nobody tells the oak tree to drop its fruit and spread its seed. But that's what it does because that's how God made the oak tree. This is a call of missions. We need to stop doing it because we feel obligated. We do missions because that is the only thing we know how to do. Because of the Christ that is in us that fell on fertile ground. So let's remove the thorns that choke the word. And allow us Christ to work in us to minister to the people on the other side. Whoever that might be. Right? So then interestingly... On the west side, Jesus did a miracle. People, demons were cast out. People brought more people. On the east side, Jesus did this miracle. They saw that the way of life was being disrupted by Jesus. They're like afraid. They knew a miracle happened because they'd seen this man live in the tomb for years and years. Right? But they were afraid. They're like, can you just leave? Go from here. Sometimes... The response is this way. People don't want to hear about Christ. Right? And so this is where the seed works magic. Because this man who was healed told Jesus, okay, now I'm the new person. Can I come back to the west side with you? I want to come back to where you're at. I want to be with you, which is an absolutely wonderful desire. But Jesus said what? Go to your own home. Go to the place you are placed. And tell other people about me. Do for others what was done for you. And this is the situation we are in. The seed was planted in us. We want to always be in this cocoon of a, the safety of the church. But Jesus is saying, I want you to go to this new place. I want you to go to this other place. I want you to stay in the place you're at, in the job you're at, and to minister there. I want you to be a blessing in your family. I want you to do missions with your friends. Tell people about them. Come out of the cocoon. Let us cast the seed where we're placed. See, missions is not about, you know, some of us need to go to somewhere else because God is sending us there and we're, we're hindering His word. Uh, the worship team, please come forward. Um, some of us, God is telling us we need to move somewhere else 
and God is wanting to do a new thing. Some of our children need to go somewhere else because God wants to build something with them there. But some of us, God wants us to remain where we're at and to cast his seed there. Wherever God is leading us, are we faithful in planting his seed and fulfill the call of the mission? I mean, I, I'm, I'm so thankful uh, if, uh, for this church that is so good at giving and opening your heart last year. We had so, I'm going to talk about it later, but we had so many needs for people that, um, that needed help during COVID and all these things. And you opened your heart and gave so much to help them. We're so good at giving. While we, while we don't stop doing that, will we answer the call that God gave Isaiah? Who will go for us? Who will go for us? Each one of us need to go for us. That's why in chapter 4, uh, verse 26, I'm going to conclude with this, 26 and 27. And so, the, so is the kingdom of God as if a man should cast seed into the ground and should sleep and rise night and day and the seed should spring and grow up. He knoweth not how. For the earth bringeth forth fruit of herself, first the blade, then the ear, and after that the full corn in the ear. For when the fruit is brought forth, immediately he put it in the sickle, because the har harvest is come. So it is not our job to bring fr uh, forth the fruit. It's our job to cast the seed. And we might watch it, and we don't know, just like when we plant something, we don't see something growing with our children. We don't see how they grow on a day-to-day -day basis. But you look back at old pictures, and you see how little where they were and where they're at today. This is the fruit working on its own, what they were supposed to do. Just like if we cast a seed and God gives the increase and he does the mission, then he brings forth the fruit 30, 60, 100 times. So who will go for us? This is the call of mission. Amazing.